My name is Julia Burns, and I am the Administrative Assistant at the Monarch County Historical Association. I'm pleased to welcome you to our monthly third Thursday lecture series. On your screen, you will find your menu bar and the controls to submit questions via the Q&A function. We ask that you use this function to post all of your questions for tonight's speaker. Questions can be submitted at any time throughout the program, but will be answered following the presentation. I am so very happy to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Ken Sandry. Ken Sandry is currently employed with the Forest Service as the Heritage Program Manager at Gray Towers National Historic Site in Milford, PA. He has a degree in anthropology and has had a career in cultural resource protection for 40 years. Ken wrote a book titled A Matter of Style in 1989 on architectural styles, which led him to focus on historic preservation. He joined a fledgling group in 2007 called the Historic Barn and Farm Foundation of PA, which documents the timber frame craftsmanship of the Four Bay Barn in the Eastern United States. Today, the organization is a major partner with the PA State Bureau of Historic Preservation and collaborates with adjoining states to save our agricultural structures. Ken also serves on the Stroudsburg Borough's Historic Architectural Review Board to assist the community's property owners in maintaining their building's architectural character. He currently serves on the Board of Directors of the Monroe County Historical Association. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to welcome Ken Sandry, who will give us his presentation, The Four Bay Barn, Its Origin, Evolution, and Distribution in America. Ken, take it away. Thank you, Julia, for such a nice introduction. I appreciate it very much. Um, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome. Um, I'd like to share with you what I know and understand about the Four Bay Barn, uh, also called the Pennsylvania Barn. Um, that is a descriptive term, not uh, that it's the state barn, it's just where it originated. Um, most of these photos that you'll see in most of my slides will be photos, accumulation of photos that I've taken with that group. Uh, Julia mentioned the Historic Barn and Farm Foundation of Pennsylvania were a, a, a statewide group. Um, and uh, we have a lot of fun <laughs> out there looking at barns all over the state and even out of the state sometimes. Um, we're advocates for privately owned barns and farmland. Um, we usually meet in June and we do a barn tour in one of the counties of Pennsylvania. This year, I think is in Cumberland. The, the year coming up, 23, is gonna be in Cumberland County. Um, so uh, save some questions and ask them at the end of the presentation, if you don't mind. Um, and let's move on to our First slide. All right, this is a, a group of photos of barns that you see in advertisements, commercials. Uh, most of them are from out west in the Midwest. The only two that you might see in our area are on the left. Um, the Adams, uh, the round barn is in Adams County. Um, it's that not, not a very common barn. It's kind of rare. Uh, barn type, but uh, we have two and uh, maybe three in Pennsylvania. Um, I won't be talking about that barn. And the barn on the lower left is a Dutch barn, which we find in Sussex County, New Jersey, in the northern corners of Pennsylvania, northeastern corners of Pennsylvania, and but mostly in uh, the Dutch settled areas of New York. Okay, so this is a four bay barn. So I mentioned in the first slide, uh, pay attention to F-O-R-E, the four bay, because the four bay is the cantilevered um, section of the barn that hangs over the stable doors. Um, that was originated, we'll talk about the origins of that uh, particular feature, um, but you see them all over Eastern and Southern, South Central and even Western Pennsylvania, uh, mostly in the Southern half of the state though. Um, but the, uh, the cantilevered portion is functional. It protects the stable doors um, from winter snows, from snow building up. You're trying to get the animals out in the winter. 
Um, it is also serves the four bay in the above in the second level um, as a granary storage originally. Um, so we'll talk about the way uh, the barn has evolved in terms of its form in some of the slides. Now here on the left, some of you, is, some of you might be familiar with Eric Sloan's book, uh, books, series of books, um, such a great artist and a good historian. Uh, he documented some four bay barns in, in some of his books, um, the best of which I took a, a picture of and, and posted there on the left. On the right is a page from Bob Insminger's book. Bob Insminger wrote um, probably the, it's considered the Bible for barn folks. Um, he really did a lot of research, a very interesting uh, geographer and professor down at Coastal University. Uh, I should say it's the late Bob Insminger who died in 2020, uh, much, to, much to the chagrin of all of us. Um, he was a, a great leader and part of our barn group. So the Four Bay Barn, um, called the Four Bay Barn by most people now, but uh, historically the name uh, Pennsylvania Barn for where it originated here in Pennsylvania, uh, or a Swiss or German bank barn. Um, and the bank is of course the uh, entry to the, on the backside to the second level. It is the dominant barn in the state of Pennsylvania and Probably um, in, in the country, we haven't been able to come up with the numbers yet, but it is probably among the top two barn types in the country, if not number one. So here are uh, the banked parts or the ramps. Um, in most places that are flat, it's, uh, it's a ramp leading up to the backside of the barn to the second level. Um, in places where there's hillsides, which is where it really originated in the hillsides of, of uh, Europe. We'll be talking about that shortly. Um, the slope was such that they just built into the slope and the backside was already at ground level. So the, the second level was easy to access. Um, as evidenced by this drawing, this is again from uh, Eric Sloan book. Um, animals were all livestock was on the first floor, on the basement level. And um, the uh, processing of grain and um, storage of grains were on the second level. So the granary was up there, the threshing floor, and all the processes with um, threshing and winnowing the, 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 uh, the grain uh, happened on the second level. And of course, they stored hay for the animals feed there also. Um, one item of note, which I might not get to, except that I'm looking at it here, is that when you're looking at a barn, if the barn is the only thing standing, uh, or even if the, the houses are standing, um, the horses were always stabled closest to the house. That's a telltale sign. If you're looking, there's only the barn on the property left, maybe the property's been developed. Um, you'll probably find evidence for the horse stables on the side that was towards the house. Here is the upper level. Um, it's kind of a crude drawing. It's from Bob Ensminger's book. Um, the four bay isn't quite as big as it should be. Normally a four bay is probably about, uh, in depth, it's usually seven to nine feet. Um, granary usually near the four bay or in the four bay. Um, threshing floor and machinery storage on either side. And then hay mows were filled to the rafters on, on both ends of the barn. And here is a view down two different four bays. Um, you can tell that the frame is uh, to, the, to the right on the right slide and on the left on the left side, the left uh, picture. Um, functional in that it was used for storage. Sometimes the granary was there, sometimes it, it, it moves later. Um, but it's a very interesting component of the barn. And there's a lot of evidence um, for other things in the, in the floor. Uh, moving on, I thought I'd throw in four um, typical barns for Monroe County. Um, we have a couple from Ch uh, Cherry Valley one from Poplar Valley, and another one from, um, I believe this is in the 
rural East Stroudsburg area, the one on the lower right. Okay, so I want to describe the origins and the evolution of the four bay boner. Um, again, I want to mention two books, Bob Ensminger's book, Robert Ensminger on the right there, the Pennsylvania barn, just a, a fantastic work. Uh, he was a geographer, but he did a lot of very good work on studying the evolution of the barn. He uh, began that um, early on. He's a um, German heritage and was very interested in um, where the barn came from. And he saw a picture of his wife's grandfather standing in front of a barn that looked like it was from Pennsylvania, but it was in Switzerland. So then that led him in another direction with documenting agricultural structures. And he spent 30 years until he published his first edition of this book, uh, The Pennsylvania Barn, and is now in the second edition. The, the book on the left, and the reason I put that in was the first book on The Pennsylvania Barn, or The Four of Avon, written in 1955 by Alfred Shoemaker. He was breaking new ground because no one had written a definitive book on barns in general uh, uh, um, prior to him, um, where it focused in particular on how the barn evolved. So that, that's a, a, you'll find both books online. The Shoemaker book is expensive usually because it's, uh, it's an antique now, uh, but Bob Ensminger's book is, is available online. It can, be, it can be found relatively easy, uh, especially down in the Lehigh Valley because that's where he lived uh, until he passed away in 2020. So here we are in Alpine, Italy. Um, this is one of the areas, um, Alpine, Italy, Switzerland, and um, Austria is where you'll find these barns. And again, because of the steep hillsides, um, the ability to, or, or the, the need to mow hay there and store it for the fodder for the, the livestock, um, that's where the four bay evolved. These aren't the best pictures, um, I didn't run into the, the best examples like Bob Bensminger searched out in the Switzerland uh, uh, valleys, but um, this gives you an idea of what, what we're finding and the kind of area we're, we're finding these barns. This particular barn isn't too far from where my family is in Northern Italy. Um, it is a three level barn, which is interesting in itself. It was a first level entry for the stables and a second level working level in the barn. And then there's a third level storage, which is entered through a ramp, uh, a bridge that, that we call here in, in Pennsylvania. We do have examples of this type of uh, three level barn in Pennsylvania. It's not rare. It's not common, but it's not rare. I would say I've probably seen in, in our tours, maybe about 25 or 30. Um, but that's of the hundreds of barns that we've visited. Um, this barn was built in uh, uh, 1840, 1840 is the date there on, the, on one of the beams. These are more barns. Um, the, upper, the upper right is that same barn um, with my cousin's husband there standing and then the owner. Um, the other barn is another three-level barn. I did not get to go in this barn, but it is a four-bay barn. Uh, it's kind of unusual, and it's in the town of, um, I forget the name of the town, but uh, it's right in the middle of town. Obviously, the town grew up around this farm. Um, and the two in the lower, <laughs> the lower photos, I'd like to point out, are uh, relatively new. I mean, I saw the one in 2001 being worked on. I actually saw the crew building it. So they're continuing the tradition. And the one on the lower left is a, uh, is a restaurant. Um, and they used the, a complete wraparound four bay, which exists over there too, and an open, uh, what they call a talina. Um, it's open and those, uh, those bars would be used traditionally in a barn as drying racks for the hay. They would just hang the, hang, hang the hay over those racks and let them dry rather than in piles in the field. So this image is from Bob Ensminger's book. 
Um, it shows on the far left, you see Switzerland barn, uh, log barn coming to America is what the arrows are indicating. And then how each subtype of the major types of, of the Pennsylvania barn or the four bay barn um, evolving in different parts of the state for different reasons, different purposes um, that the farmer determined was, was important for him. But this just goes to show you um, the, the sheer number 34, if I'm looking at the numbers right, I think it's 34 different types, subtypes of the Pennsylvania barn, depending upon where you are in Pennsylvania. Of course, it's mixed in some counties. So the major types of the four bay barn, we were looking at the, the previous, the previous slide was of uh, a lot, all the subtypes, but the major types are the Schweitzer, and that is a asymmetrical table end, uh, I'll show you in a second, and a standard barn, which is uh, the most common uh, barn, uh, four bay barn shape, and the extended barn. And I'll explain those different types of extended, extended front and then rear, and, uh, and with a different shed. Okay, so here are the three types. Schweitzer has an asymmetrical gable end. They are the earliest barns. They usually have steeply pitched roofs. You can see them from afar. Um, and and this, this is the four bay cantilevering over the stable doors. Um, a common feature amongst all of them is that the beams, the floor beams, are one solid piece of wood, or they, they cross over a summer beam that's a real wide. Uh, that is the, the common element to the four bay, is that the cantilevered beam supports the four bay. In the case of the standard barn, the four bay can be hidden behind a closed wall, We'll see the end walls called the closed four bay. I'll show you pictures of that. But this is essentially open. This is the stable door, and this is open except on the ends where the wall has continued over. And instead of adding a different frame for the four bay, they incorporate the whole big barn frame and just shorten the foundation or widen the barn over the foundation, um, however you want to describe it. Um, again, Cantilevered um, floor beams support or uh, define the four bay. Um, and the, the frame itself is a consistent symmetrical frame, symmetrical roof line over top of the four bay. Now, in the extended barn, um, different things can happen. You can have an extension out the back because of increased need for storage, uh, increased needs for the animals. Um, or you could have one out the front and extended and posted. Um, Bob determined, um, talking to an engineer, Bob Ensmeyer, that if you extend past nine feet, you were endangering a cantilever. So as a four bay gets deeper, you need to post. You need to put a post out in front of the four bay. And we'll see examples of that in the following slides. So again, here's the Schweitzer. This is from the Moyer Barn in Berks County. It's right from Bob Ensminger's book. A beautiful barn, I've been there, it's beautiful. And we'll talk about the, uh, the truss system in it too, which is very interesting. These are down near Hagerstown. Um, both of them uh, just over the border. This one is in Antietam um, Battlefield and was restored by the Natural Park Service. Uh, this one is privately owned. It's a very small stone barn with a four bay out front. Ignore that post that was put in by the owner for, uh, I think, a fence purpose, but uh, it was cantilevered out front of this, this barn. Beautiful barn right, at, right northeast of Hagerstown. These are in the general area down there also near Hagerstown. Uh, this is a brick ender barn. There is a band of brick ender barns uh, in south, south central to southeast Pennsylvania and into Maryland. Um, and that's their, their band of existence. There are some outside the area as far as like Carlisle, 
in a few as far east as, as near Philadelphia, but the majority of them are in that area. And this barn is its neighbor. Uh, both of them are Schweitzers, as you can tell. The longer front roof line that forms the cantilevered floor bay. And here, and you can see because of wood and the wood and brick contrast. Now, a little deceiving on, on some of these, but uh, again, a, this lower left is a, a Schweitzer. Um, this is in Franklin County, Pennsylvania. A beautiful barn, well-preserved. The family did such a great job. Very little changes. Even hardware on the doors is still original. It's amazing. This here barn is owned by a family. They don't farm anymore, but they put the addition back here. And it was for, uh, um, I think a woodworking operation for the husband, but essentially this was a Schweitzer. When you walk in, you can tell this is the barn right here. And this is looking into their, um, their floor bay out front. Um, the fact that it's not cantilevered, I'll explain that later. That's a later change. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a beautiful barn and, and a log barn. It's, the log barns are always interesting. This barn down here is posted. It has stone posts. Um, they are original. This is down near Chester County. This is where you find most of the stone posted um, four bays. Um, this is probably 12 feet. So they had to add some posts in here. I assume there was a stone post in this area that was, must have failed and they put in some, some wood posts, but originally this was stone posted. Um, the Fox Barns in Berks County. Again, another log barn, fantastic, well taken care of. Again, all the hardware, the family has preserved this barn fantastically. This is part of our barn group uh, touring the barn. Um, it is a half dovetailed um, log notching. Just beautifully done. A lot of rot hardware in here. Um, just can't speak enough to the families that preserve their barn so well. This here is a ground barn um, called a Grundschire in German. Um, the, this is the earliest photograph known. I think it is from uh, post-Civil War. It's the earliest one known in down in, uh, I think, Bucks County is where this was taken. Uh, and the image was taken from a newspaper, uh, I believe. I've never seen it live. I've only seen photographs of the image. And here's an example of a Grunshire. In a Grunshire, there is no, no access to the second level. It's a four bay and you have to go up a ladder or you load your hay upstairs through uh, doors, similar to this, uh, for storage. Uh, for some reason, they did not have a ramp to the second level. So it's called a Grunshire. So agricultural capabilities um, in the United States started to grow. 90% um, of the population at the turn of the 1800s and into the 19th century was, it was the dominant job, the dominant industry for people in America. They were farming. Um, it became very lucrative. The soil was fertile. There was a lot of land. Um, families grew, and even in the 1840s, 70% of the people were farmers. So um, the capabilities grew, and the capacity was there. Um, farmers needed to go from these small barns, which we saw in the previous uh, picture, these log barns, and they had to start building bigger barns. Their families were growing. It might have happened over a generation, but even so, they, they really need to expand. And so we see this physically occurring in the barns. What happens? So we start seeing logs that were notched for a log building being used in a second generation barn, larger barn. This log barns originally Oh, they were somewhere around 20 by 40. 
uh, next level barns, they're growing. They're almost double in their capacity. Um, and then there's even third generation barns. But, but this is the most significant find. We keep, now that once we noticed this, our barn group noticed this on our tours, we ended up uh, seeing it almost every other barn. We see these because people were frugal. If the beans were good, they reused them as floor joists. They might not have been long enough, so they put them over a summer bean. Um, that is just typical of what we're seeing. And so it tells us, on, usually we come on site, we can say, well, there was a log barn here before because of these joists that we see. And the house is, was built in 1870, so there must have been an earlier house. And we go back to the tax records and sure enough, if, you know, if the, part of, if the pro property is interesting enough, we might go back and research that or someone might, and we find out that this has been occurring on, on farms. And, and uh, probably not only farms, but we, we see this reuse of material. It's a great indicator. Now the bent, uh, the bent configurations of a standard barn. So again, we talked about the standard barn as being um, asymmet asymmetrical, um, gable end um, through the barn. You have different bent configurations. Um, they were usually done by a master carpenter. They usually had a plan. Uh, sometimes a, a master carpenter, timber framer would use the same plan um, in the area of his influence, wherever he worked in a county or a two county area. Uh, him and his workers would uh, um, build barns for their, you know, 30 years of, of operation, maybe 40 years. And sometimes we can see the same barn um, within an, an area, and we almost know that there's influence of this barn builder building the same type of barn. And we even have regionalisms, which are features that we find throughout a county because it was believed to be good for the stability of the barn. Um, very interesting. Um, timber frame configurations are dateable and they can provide us with a lot of information. We can usually, our group can usually get together and talk about a barn and come up with a 20 year span for when it was uh, originally built. Again, notice the four bays here, 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 here behind, a, behind an end wall. And we'll see photos of that here and, and then behind this. Okay, so here are some extended barns. Remember I said it can happen out the front or out the back. Um, in this case, I'm gonna move my image. So in this case, uh, it was a Schweitzer barn, um, probably from the originally, but they made a stone out shed. Now, why would they do that? Well, whenever we see an out shed, normally it's the granary. The granary has moved from the front to the back by design. Um, and the indicator is the door. This door enters right into the granary. Why? It's because that's how they outloaded the bushels of grain going to market. They outloaded them right onto a wagon. So you see a wagon pulls up and they hand out the bushels. Um, easy enough. Usually you're not loading from there, you're loading from the, the, the uh, threshing floor but offloading out this back door. And why stone? Well, the biggest problem with grain is rodents. So you wanted to make your granary as enclosed as possible. Um, we'll, we'll go into granaries, granaries and see how tight they've worked the woodwork, you know, tongue and groove wood um, boards to try to tighten it up really good. Even then the, the mice <laughs> would chew through it. But uh, then they would take old license plates and sheet tin or, or sheet metal of some sort and cover up those holes or even, or even do the hole inside of the granary if they wanted to. Um, again, on this brick barn, you see the granary door right here. This is an outshed. So the ramp coming up comes to property right about here, the ramp beyond this outshed. And what I mean by outsheds are these, these two. So this is similar to these two here. The actual barn end is ended here, and then the outsheds are here. 
Same thing down here. There's the four bay. This is an outshed, it looks like. By the, by the mortar that it might've been built later, but I doubt it. I really think it was probably built at the same time as the rest of the barn. Um, and again, it, it would look like this from behind. Here is a granary. Here are two different granaries. Um, this one here is in the outshed. I can tell by the, by the slope of the roof. And this one, I think might also be in the outshed. It was just the best photographs I had of, of the granary. Um, different bins for different grains. Um, sometimes grain is still in there on the floor. And usually in the door going into the granary from the threshing floor, we'll sometimes have hash marks where they were counting their grain, you know, one, two, three, four, slash, one, two, three, four, slash. I can't tell you how many we've seen those and documented those. I hope I have a photograph of that, but they're keeping track. Um, not all farmers were literate and um, they sometimes used uh, whatever method they could to um, keep track of their um, material that was going to market. Here is uh, this one here we saw earlier, this posted stone. I want to have that in there as one extension, uh, extended uh, four bay in this case. This one is in um, Fulton County. Um, and you have a, a really long, probably the furthest width you can go with a four bay and also an outshed with, a, um, with an opening for a, a piece of machinery. Um, that was that particular farmer's need and that's, that's what he did. But that outshed hangs over um, in an uh, in, in open space below. It's not two four bays. There is a ramp going into the backside here, and the four bay is out here. Um, a beautiful looking one. I hope it's still standing. These two barns are here. These are called, uh, Bob Hensminger calls them up country posted. Um, so upcountry, meaning mostly it was in hillier areas than the, like the Lehigh Valley or the Great Valley uh, near Chambersburg. Um, these are further upland. Um, they're always wide extensions and posted. Um, both of these, this was in Cherry Valley. This one is in Delaware Water Gap, um, Natural Recreation Area. Um, and this also served as a loafing shed for the, for the, um, livestock. So in un, unseeming weather, you know, weather that wasn't uh, the best for the animals, they would, they could move in under there. You see that now sometimes ouch, the, uh, the loafing sheds are 50 feet long. They're, they're beautiful. But this, this one has a great foundation. This one here in Cherry Valley. It hasn't been um, restained or anything, but it's, it's a, uh, it's a pretty good barn. They're, they're maintaining it at least. I to see that. And then there's one other type of extended barn and that's a gable extension. So we have a front gable that they needed that much extra space, maybe an additional four bay area and they extended the, uh, added a whole new front to the barn. This one's in Adams County, this one's in Schuylkill County and oh, this one's in Schuylkill County as well. So it looks like a three gable barn, but one extension was usually added or they're usually not built um, three gable, but they become three gable at a later date. Okay, let's talk about distribution in the United States. Um, there's a core area where they originated, and there's a domain where they're the dominant barn without a doubt. And then the sphere of influence is where we see them um, um, placed throughout the Eastern United States. I shouldn't even say Eastern because it's already been seen out in Oregon. Um, this is from Bob Ensminger's book. Um, the core area is the dark area. Um, uh, think of Germantown. So the German, early German immigrants moved out of Philadelphia into farmland. Germantown was formed and uh, the German settlers moved, Germanic settlers, I should say, uh, moved west and north out of the, you know, the, the city. Uh, because of agriculture. And so this is where we find the earliest, best examples and the most of the, the four bay, the early four bay barns, right in this area. Um, 
So the domain is this area, down into the Shenandoah Valley. There was a, a great road that came from Philadelphia, Great Wagon Road, went in towards Chambersburg, and then headed down Route 11, all into the Shenandoah Valley. This completely was all four bay barns. You know, I, I should say mostly. It was the, without a doubt, the dominant barn type. As our group started looking in the hilly areas of Western Pennsylvania, Bob extended this to be the domain. He found that without question, there's enough of the Pennsylvania barn, the four bay barn out that area to be called the dominant barn. These areas are Amish and Mennonite settlements. They took it right with them. Bob found them, Bob speaks German and Bob would go out and talk to these people and you know, hear about their grandparents and such. Um, and then the, uh, um, the small dots are little enclaves of a few here and there, here and there. Since Bob's second edition, this is from his second edition, we've already expanded this um, sphere of influence. I found them down in Southern Missouri, Western Missouri. Um, Bob found and got some phone calls from people like in Oregon and Idaho who had four bay barns. There are anomalies out there, but nonetheless, they still exist. Um, people found use for them and a need for that shape, that cantilevered protection for the stable doors uh, in a two level barn. It's just um, so useful. Um, the features weather worthy of note, um, I would say um, checking the, the, the four bay certainly needs to be looked at really well. The, temp, the bent, that's the, the configuration of the timbers that run um, laterally across the barn from eave to eave. Um, that's what forms the, the major superstructure um, across the barn. Um, that's always telltale of a lot of different uh, uh, dating and also uh, what was going on in the timber framer's mind. Um, roof systems, there's only so many. And the way the roof was constructed is very important and worth documentation. Um, any barn modifications, of course, oops, let me go back. And then dating some details like uh, how the stalls were installed, hardware um, or other features, decorations in the barn, sometimes dates. We do find dates, uh, date stones in the top of the barn, sometimes in the bottom of the barn. Um, um, they, can be, they can be very interesting. I'd have to have you in a barn to show you. Uh, this is in um, Greencastle area. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name of the family, but the, the family uh, um, chip manufacturers, I can't remember what their name, what, what their name was. But anyway, um, beautiful barn, well taken care of. Uh, this barn is in Fox County, I believe. Um, it's just beautiful, barn, just well taken care of, beautiful barns. Um, most of them are used for storage now. They're not used for agricultural purposes. People store in them. They have activities in them, or even sometimes there's weddings and barns. Um, oh, and let me go back um, real quick. This is an open four bay. There is no end wall extension. The bar, the four bay is completely open end to end. And again, this is fence related. It is not related to supporting the four bay. Um, and same here on this side. That's open four bay. What we're looking at here is a closed and a half closed four bay. So this is a closed four bay where the end wall comes all the way out and encloses the front. And that may, may be due to weather. Uh, you know, maybe I had a prevailing wind on the property and they're trying to protect the stable doors. Um, that's possible or just maybe the builder's preference, the farmer's preference. Um, this is an example of an end wall being extended out to the front of the barn. It only supports the end of the four bay beam. That's, that's it. Uh, this is a half close. This is on the Conrad Weiser property. And this is a brick wall. This wall does face north. 
So it kind of indicates to me, you know, trying to prevent drifting, going in front of the stable doors, um, something along those lines. So, you know, why do it on one half? Well, north facing wall might, might be telling you a story there. And if I can go back, this is a gable front four bay, which is not, um, not usual, it's not super rare, you will find them, but um, gable front four bay is what first occurred in Europe. What we see over in Europe in Bob's photos that he's taken in doing his book is that primarily they wanted the snow to drift off to the sides when the snow load was released from the roof. And so that was added protection for the, uh, the stable doors. And then the, of course the, the four bay would protect from just regular snowfall. Um, so then we have a posted four bay. Posted four bay, we saw a photo of that earlier. This one's down in Franklin County, brick posted, um, uh, round posts, almost always they're round. And this one is in another, another uh, uh, barn. It was the best photo I could get of, of, uh, of this round pillar. But um, there was another one out in front of the four bay. It was just blocked by so much I couldn't get a good photograph. This one here in the upper right is on Hickory Valley Road. Um, it has round posts. And I talked to the owners. We had a nice conversation. Um, it is a four bay barn, but the round posts for our curiosity. And come to find out that the original owners of the property were from Chester County. That's where the dominant that's where most of the um, uh, stone columned four bays are located. So it's interesting that the owners were from that, that area where, they're, where they see them and whether it was just a preference or they had a purpose for putting them in. Now we're gonna talk about uh, dairy operations. Huh. So um, right about the turn of the 19th, the uh, 18th to, to uh, 19th to 20th century, um, dairy operations required a change in the way farmers did their business. If you were gonna sell milk, you had to abide by certain new requirements. And that's when things like enclosing the four bay happened. So here's the fox barn, that log crib barn, and that's enclosed and they put windows in to get light in. Same, same here with this barn. Um, in this case, it's stone foundation here, but this is a uh, concrete block, an obvious change, but this was a four bay barn for sure. Um, and then also whitewash. Whitewash was used pretty extensively. It reduced the amount of pests that the uh, owners had to deal with. Um, insects don't like lime, and I don't think mice like lime very much either, but it, it reduced. It probably didn't eliminate, but it reduced the amount of um, insects, and it brightened up the space, um, a dark space with an enclosed, um, another wall in the front um, that caused some issues. So the whitewash was an addition, something that would help the farmer brighten up the area. Okay, timber um, bed configurations. I would have to have you on site to talk to you. I would gladly talk to anybody about their barns, but all types of timber frame, uh, tim timber frame bent configurations. And a bent, again, is a, a unit going eave to eave that supports the barn. You should have, you know, with the end walls, there should probably be at least five bents in most barns. Um, and they are telltale. There are so many features in these barns that can tell a story, um, uh, at least four different components of a bent that can tell a story about the barn's age and the way the carpenter was approaching it. So um, we'd have to see one to talk about it, but I wanted to show you examples. Roof framing. Okay, here's a barn down, a four bay barn, obviously down in Antietam Battlefield right after the battle. Um, it has a thatch roof. Uh, that was such a great find to find this photograph with that thatch roof. Um, all thatch roofs are steeply pitched. Um, and that's what we think was with the Fox Barn down in um, Berks County. 
um, steeply pitched roof. You'd be able to tell if we got down to the wood, if there was any remaining sheathing, we could probably tell if it was stashed, it'd be telltale signs. But that's always uh, interesting to see. Um, other, other roofs are steeply pitched and probably did, but some had uh, wood shingles, um, slate, and then later sheet metal. That could be pretty good. This one has sheet metal right now. Both of them do. But uh, those kind of roofs are always interesting to see. Sometimes um, a wood roof is underneath the sheet metal. That's so nice to see when we get inside of one and look up. Um, roof framing. Um, common rafters are when the rafters are all the same size all the way across. When you have a principal rafter, this is an English kind of development. It's kind of interesting that they're in German barns, but um, a, a principal rafter is a very large rafter um, within, within the roof system that carries a purlin. The purlin goes principal rafter to principal rafter, and they carry the common rafters. So this rafter is resting on top. These smaller ones are resting on top of the purlin, and the purlin is into the principal rafter. This here is a principal rafter on these two sides. It's not all the way up, but this is a special truss. It's a special early truss called a legenderstuhl, which means a lying chair in German. And it, it is independent of the roof. The roof rests on it. So it's very strong and it was used in Europe and it was used in America, it appears, up until very early 1900, um, 1800s, and then it disappears from use. We have two in the area. There's a better picture, the Legenderstuhl. This is the blue, seen in Europe quite a bit, uh, in traditional buildings, historic buildings. And here, this is, uh, this is a picture of one down in the Oli Valley. Um, if you are familiar with the Oli Valley, very protected National Historic Landmark. Um, here's some that we've seen in our travels. We don't run into a lot, but there's more than we thought there were. I think we're up to like 30. Legen der um, A very in interesting trust. We try to convince the, the, the uh, property owners that this is an important thing, that they need to pay attention to that. It's not just another uh, bunch of logs in the, in the, or timbers in, the, in this roof. And there's one other one, it's called the Stehenderstuhl, and that is essentially a standing stool. Um, this is in the Foster Armstrong building in Sussex County, New Jersey, Montague. Um, and essentially it looked like this, Stehenderstuhl. Again, the roof rests on this uh, rectangular, um, roof truss system. Um, let me go back real quick. I wanted to say, I thought I'd have an opportunity. There is a uh, three Legender schools in the area. One is in Cherry Valley in the Kennedy Barn, and another one is in Delaware Water Gap in the Al Abraham Van Campen House in Millbrook Village. And a third one, I'm going to forget where it is. I'm sorry. Um, high beams. High beams are very important. They run from eave to eave, and they tie into the, the uh, rafter plate in this way, the top plate. Um, they are important because at, at the change of about 1860, 70, uh, they disappear, and, and we start seeing high beams that drop below into the post. Not as strong but it served the purpose. Uh, it was easier to erect the barn with, with this kind of tie, uh, drop tie beam because they could erect them with, uh, the bands could go up like you see a typical barn raising. It's a little different because if you have the tie beam that goes over the top plate, then it's, it's a little more complicated with uh, the uh, installation. But these, this here is in Cherry Valley, the one on the right. I'm not sure about the one on the left. Um, Long construction, long crib barns, um, you know, foundations put in and the top, the first floor is laid and then two long cribs are built to hold the hay. Um, they become the hay mile. 
And then the barn is built around those log cribs. Um, so you have notched logs that are the traditional way of notching that you've seen, you know, V notch. Um, and we also have um, logs directly into the post. So it's a posted log building. So these are mortise and tendon into the post. Definitely stronger joint. Um, this is in a home. This is in a barn, but we saw quite a few of these down in Schuylkill County. And the only reason we can come up with is that Schuylkill County um, developed pretty early. It was settled pretty early and developed pretty early, and then it was, you know, it lost its lost its place in the economy, and it got uh, it got to be more of a struggling county. I want to say uh, agriculture continued, but it was a little. Um, I think it was less likely that you'd see changes if the, uh, the landowner wasn't making the kind of money that he wanted to make. Um, other things you see, you see marriage marks. This is when uh, um, barns were being built. They essentially are being fabricated outside on saw horses on the ground um, and then uh, fitted and then they're re-erected in place. Well, when you had a uh, um, scribe rule being used, you had to mark each piece of where they went because they fit in one spot only. Um, very interesting to see this. You see it quite a bit because scribe rule was used for a long time before square rule came into effect. Uh, and all these numerals mean something. Um, the flags mean the location, the, the, the bent number. And this is the joint number, the number five. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but you, you get the picture. Of course, we see artwork in the barn. See the brickwork? This is down in Franklin County. Uh, um, um, farm owner on a, on a horse, um, right in the gable end. Uh, we see dates, we see names, we see artwork. Uh, you just have to look. Usually they are inscribed, these, the wooden ones, are usually inscribed on the threshing floor walls. Um, that's where we look. We just shine lights down the, down the wall and you see them pop out. Um, barn decorations, things called hex signs. Um, they are not to do with witchcraft as um, Mr. Nutting put in an article uh, way back when and it had, it made, made it, I don't know, people got fascinated with the fact that it could be witchcraft or, or some kind of uh, voodoo or whatever, but they are not that. German families have told Bob they were just for nice. Um, and they were decorations that were mostly celestial, um, stars, um, peace signs. There were, there were all kinds of images that were done. Um, and Patrick Dunmoyer wrote this book, on, on the origin and what their meaning is um, with all his interviews. And he's visited every barn, he said, that has barn decorations on it. They're actually very beautiful. And uh, he's helped the painter who has redone a lot of these on barns. So dating techniques, um, again, barn type and subtype, um, noting the construction, the size and the configuration. Timber framing methods, um, evidence of their manufacturer, whether it's uh, hewn or sawn uh, timbers. Um, hardware is always good for helping date a barn. And uh, any unusual or unique features is, is always worth um, doing. I'll certainly help anybody that wants to document their barn. Um, doing a small drawing, even if it's handwritten, like like this one is that I did years ago for um, a group down in in um, uh, Northampton County. Um, just doing a little evaluation, you take a day, and you'd have a lot of information. Um, and then, in summary, just those particular things: dimensions, the timber frame, its fabrication, and uh, special construction. And then, I'd like to hear. Any questions? Um, Brady, interested 
folks out there who have anything to ask. Is there any questions that um, have come out? Hi, Ken. Hi. We do have some questions. Thank you so much, first of all, for that very in-depth presentation. Oh, we learned Lord. a lot about Barnes today. Um, a few questions for you, so let me go to the Q&A. Okay, hey, let's go. Okay, first question. Do you ever come across Stone End Barnes? My twin uncles both had four bay barns, but one had stone ends. Oh, yes. Yes, you can see in the in the center picture there are stone end barns. That's uh, more common down in the limestone area, um, where the um, where the stone was available, uh, where stone was quarried. I would say that that's if, if stone quarrying was um, available, and there were masons, um, stone barns do okay. exist. All right, here's another question: mm -hmm. Did Germanic immigrants take the four bay barn to other countries than the US such as Brazil or Argentina. Oh, I, I am I am sure of it. I am sure of it. I have no information about that, but uh people love traditions and they usually carry them with them wherever they go. So I'd be interested to hear whoever asked that question if they know of some, that'd be great. Okay, um how did you come to be so passionate about this subject? Oh, <laughs> it's that group, that group of guys, you know, all of us are over 50 years old and uh, Bob was 90 and still going to these barn tours. Um, it is just so much fun to go out with a bunch of knowledgeable people, timber framers, architectural historians, interested parties, geographers um, who they just they have passion, so they we we really enlivened ourselves with uh, with the interest, and we would be like a bunch of kids running around the barn. You know, look at this, look at that. Oh, I've never seen it. it was uh, it's it's an amazing um, discovery time. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, is four by still the predominant style of new barns that are built in PA? I do not think so. I think that the the dominant form now, unfortunately, is a pole barn. I think if if a farmer needs a barn to store hay, he puts up a, a an inexpensive barn to save himself money. I can't blame him, but I wish more people would look into investing in these timber frame barns because they're so strong. I've seen people try to tear them down, and timber frame resists bulldozers. Wow! Long enough that you're impressed. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Um, all of these barns look really big. What's a typical size for a four bay barn? And is there very much variation in sizes? There is variation and it usually in regards to the, the farmer's operation, how big his farm was. Um, early barns were smaller, later barns are larger. Average, I would say, I would say that falls in the area of like 35 feet wide to about 60 long or you know the long side on the front okay. um that seems to be about the average but we've had them um the kennedy barn that has that league end that are stool down in cherry valley um that's a that, that's a beautiful barn that is about i think it's near 100 feet by 40 and the interesting thing about that is it was built in 1796 Wow. Almost the same year as the Stroud Mansion. I know, yeah, a year younger. It was that that old of a barn and very impressive uh, property. And the and the uh, the owners, the Kennedys, took really good care to repair it. It was in bad shape. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Would these barns uh, typically be found on any type of farm in PA, or were they more limited to the wealthier farmers and landowners? Seems like they would be kind of expensive to build and maintain. No, actually not. They they were built. Um, I think it was definitely by, definitely built according to the farmer's uh, means, um, but definitely his needs. And farmers would build uh, four bay barns of log. You'd be surprised how much effort would be put into it, and they were just a single family. Um, uh, barns were a major part of the operation when agriculture was big in Pennsylvania they couldn't invest enough in their farms because they would make more and more money if they had mm. end grain they were doing fantastic and I would say the answer is no 
that, that these were built up until the mid 20th century, like 1940s, these barns were being built by farmers and, uh, and used and maintained. And okay. now there's less use. Okay, another question. Um, besides studying barns, how does your group work to encourage preservation of the barns? Well, that's how we're partnered with the uh, historic barn. The historic Barn and Farm Foundation is partnered with the State Historic Preservation Office. State Historic Preservation Office has a mitigation fund from PennDOT um, that actually uh, provides grants that people can apply to. Um, and the, the Historic Barn and Farm Foundation um, goes through those applications and makes the decision on who will get the money each year. So um, people should continually apply until, until they get one. The other way we help is we provide them with contacts, um, like timber framers to help them get a repair done. Um, roofs a little less often because there's so many contractors that can do roofs um, or painting, but um, structural things, masonry and timber frame, I would say that's the way we help them the most. And we usually help them document their barn let them understand what's important about the board. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's all the questions that we have. Is there anything else you want to share? I don't have anything else to share. I just, is uh, if people have a barn that they want to get uh, documented or they want to talk about, they can contact me through uh, the MCHA and I will, okay. uh, I'll help them if I can. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was fabulous. Sure. Uh, thank you everyone tuned in tonight. And I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thanks again, Ken. Thank you, everybody.